All right, this is John Krasinski, Pittsburgh Soccer. Now with me is Jordan Smith. Jordan, how you doing tonight? Uh, the long Thanksgiving weekend. I think we're all stuffed, and it's it's been a good weekend. It's been cold outside. Uh, lots of still soccer to keep up with. Unfortunately, the Pittsburgh Riverhounds are not one of the teams that we can keep up with at this point. Uh, the USL Cup is being played tonight, as uh, probably within the next hour as we speak. Uh, but before we sit down and watch that match, Jordan, you and I are going to kind of dissect the Pittsburgh Riverhound situation as they head into the offseason. As they head into this offseason, Jordan, there's a lot of big decisions Bob Lilly and his staff have to make, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm excited to see what's going to happen. Um, as we were talking earlier, uh, so it's Vidiello, Danny Griffin, and uh, Dequa, right, are the three where um, they, they aren't signed for next season. There isn't a contract option. So it's going to be very tough to bring all three of them back. Uh, will the staff want to bring them back? Um, my guess, and this is just a complete guess, is that they'd be willing to move on from Dequa. Um, goalies in this league also seem to be pretty replaceable, although Vidiello, I mean, great guy, great goalie. So sure, I'd like to have him back. But if there's a way to bring back Danny Griffin, I mean, I'd love to because he was consistently in the top five, top 10 in passes in the, the whole USL. And he really just sat back in that sixth spot and just facilitated play. So I'd love for him to come back. Yeah, well, just to clarify, too, um, all I think valid, I think a lot of your points I you know alluded to and mentioned in my piece, uh, my Hounds Notebook piece earlier this past week, where those three individuals, they signed contracts with the Riverhounds at the beginning of the two, 2020 season. That was the original deal is it's a, and this is pretty much how almost all of the contracts work. It's a one year contract with the team holds the option. And in the case of the Riverhounds last go after last season, they did, uh, they did take the option seasons for Vitiello, Dequa, and Griffin going into 2021 season. So they signed them to the option season in 2021. And you know, all three showed how valuable they can be to, to, to this past year's team. Um, we saw that. But like you said, questions linger about Dequa and his health, maybe his health, maybe his consistency of play. Uh, Vitiello, I think, was outstanding and i think yeah. in a different world maybe in an mls structured salaried world or other situations you know maybe the hounds find a way to to keep him as a long-term option but really the way bob Lilly has operated in his time in pittsburgh in his four years every year it seems like rotation of keepers in 2020 and 2021 danny vitiello really was the guy for the most part, I think he, he really ascended into the starting role halfway through the 2020 season. Um, yeah, I think it's going to be tough to keep it yellow, so, right? Yeah, yeah, it, it'll be tough. I mean, and knowing him, he's probably thinking about trying to keep moving up um, in his career, and, and how can you blame him? I mean, Robbie Mertz, you know, did the same thing. He's captain of the Atlanta United 2 team and just trying to get that next step up to the MLS, so... I don't blame them. Um, you know, I, I hope they chase their goals and their dreams, but um, definitely it'll be interesting to see what defenders they re-sign um, and bring back uh, or if there's that option, um, because I, I think the back line, I, I have a feeling Bob Lilly isn't uh, fully comfortable with it after this past season. For sure. And let's let's do this. Um, well, I, I'd like to talk a little bit more about Danny Griffin and then we can dissect and talk about all of the players that the Riverhounds do hold contract options for. They have right now, they have 12 players that they signed to new deals in 2021. And they also, have, well, and it add a tack on to that. There's, there are four more players who were, have been with the team for a while and you re-signed also with the team. So actually in total right now, they have 15 total players that they hold options for heading into 2022. So, Hold that thought, but first, mm -hmm. you know, your, your thoughts again, um, you know, Danny Griffin is the type of player that we've seen in recent years, the Riverhounds, you know, they got two years out of him. They maxed used his contract 
and maybe Tommy Vankiazio, Rob Mertz, you know, Joe Greenspan, uh, Toby Adewale, all those guys, once their contract options were were uh, ex expired and satisfied, the Hounds were not able to re-sign them. Um, but you, you're making a case that, you know, because of the durability, I believe he started and played in all 32 matches this past season, Danny Griffin did. Yeah. 32 games. I think he maybe, I think he, he was about 12 or 13 minutes short of, of a yeah. <laughs> full season. Yeah. Yeah. That's like a, a high school kid who never missed class like once out of the whole year. He, he just, it, it's unbelievable how he was able to play that many minutes and never once did he look tired either. Like there, there are some guys sometimes where I'm like, oh, they could probably use a break here. They're just running so much, but Danny Griffin just, yeah, did not, did not need a break at all. So yeah, I'd, I'd love to have him back. It, it's going to be difficult. Um, I hope he wants to stay, but um, that'll obviously be up to him and, and the coaching staff and the organization to keep him around. And I thought we were a little tough on him at the beginning of the season. I think we were yeah. looking for certain things, maybe because we thought in terms of his his he came to the Riverhounds as kind of an attacking midfielder. He had mm -hmm. that that ability uh, in the final third to do some good, some, do some really good things. But as he progressed as a player in Pittsburgh, in his first two professional seasons, he really developed into late, as you talked about that that number six. Yeah, uh, it's it's weird. You know, some players they just um, they just end up fitting in somewhere else a little bit better, or a different position. You know, sometimes a right back ends up being really good in the six or someone who played a lot in the six, they move out to right back. I mean, I, I've seen this uh, when I grew up playing um, and I see this at Point Park where I work. I've seen it at the Riverhounds, you know, all over the place. Growing up, I always wanted to play center mid, but I was always put up top. <laughs> you know, I wasn't I wasn't big enough, not too physical to really handle that center mid position. And Danny Griffin's not a, a tall guy, but, you know, he's he's well built. You know, um, it's not like he can't handle himself in there. But, yeah, it, we I guess in the beginning, we expected all this production from him and more assists. And I, I felt like he truly deserved more than I think just one assist he had on the season. But um, and Kenny, too, I, I feel like he should always have more than he had. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, he just he did his job. Um, he just he sat back and he rarely screwed up out there. He, he was great. And that's that's a, the valid point there. So I think there definitely will be interest on the open market, the free agent market. And it gets very interesting. So just to reiterate, I don't know if we mentioned this right at the start of our discussion here today, but November 30th is when all the USL contracts expire. Uh, for so at least for every player on the Riverhounds roster. And so the, the, it, you know, it becomes up to the team whether they um, will then decide to renew uh, the players they have options for and then start moving forward towards planning for the 2022 season. All right, so uh, let's just bear with me here for a second. But we have, uh, we wanted to talk about players that um, the Riverhounds hold contract options for. So again, you can check it out in the Hounds notebook in, on Pittsburgh Soccer Now this week. But let's just go through the list here, Jordan, real quick. Um, Jake Leaker, uh, goalkeeper. Uh, Ezra Armstrong, uh, an outside back, a winger. Uh, Mikhail Williams, center back. Jalen Robinson, another kind of hybrid defender, center back. Preston Kilwin, uh, again, another hybrid defender, played a little bit of outside back, played some center back this past year. Shane Wheat, uh, center back, uh, did, logged a lot of minutes, was a very durable player for yeah. the Hounds this year. Jelani Peters, uh, Casey Bartlett-Scott, center back. So, uh, again, two more center backs. You, just, you were just talking earlier about uh, what are they going to do with all these defensive players that they signed this year uh, to revamp their back line. Um, and then also here come some of the big names, you know, Todd Wharton, uh, in the midfield, uh, Alex Dixon, uh, Josh Gatt is still under, was under, uh, contract through the season, even though he didn't play much of the year, um, Louis Perez, and then finally Russell Cicerone. The other, as I mentioned, there was some other players, uh, we didn't mention it, Canardo Forbes, Jordan Dover, and also Danny Rivera are all players who've been with the Hounds uh, for a number of years now. Um, I believe it'll be Forbes and Dover both have played four, all four years under Lily. 
Rivera has been here since been in Pittsburgh since 2019. And Anthony Velarde, who we want to mention, really the first news, if you will, the first player we have knowledge of will not be in Pittsburgh, will not be coming back in 2022. He uh, posted on his Instagram at the, uh, you know, appreciated all the, the support and um if you check out Anthony Velarde's Instagram account, he is not returning, whether it's his choice, whether the coaching staff, you know, had that postseason discussion with him uh, right after the season ended and he will not be back that we do know. So Jordan, um, add, on that, out of that group, uh, maybe we can start with uh, Leaker. What are, what are your thoughts on the backup keeper for the Hounds? I know you were in uh, a loud United match. I think one of the, I think few, maybe five or six matches he played this year. Yeah, I was at that Loudon game uh, there in Virginia, and they they lost that game. It was disappointing. I believe it was two to one, but um, that that game wasn't you know really his fault. Um, I mean, the the team they they benched about five or six starters, maybe something like that. Um, you know, it wasn't looking good, so they subbed in Forbes in the second half. I think they subbed in Cicerone too. Um, I remember at one point Leaker was slightly injured and I saw Danny Vidiello at the bench hop up. I've never seen someone so excited to, to go in. I mean, I'm sure, you know, he doesn't want Leaker to be hurt, right. but he was, he definitely looked like he didn't want to sit out that game. You know, uh, Vidiello comes off as someone that wants to play every game, but yeah, Leaker, um, I don't know. Um, I have a vibe that they're not fully confident for him starting 20 some games for the Hounds throughout the whole season. That's just what I think. Uh, maybe do they like him as that backup that can play those, you know, uh, non-divisional games or whatever? Um, yes, maybe. Um, so we'll just have to see. But I don't think he showed anything flashy that was like, all right, this guy is going to be the guy moving forward. Whereas Vitiello came into um, 2020, I believe Gomez was also there, an experienced USL keeper, and he – beat him out. He beat him, yeah. beat him out halfway through the season. He Bob Lilly and the staff saw things that they liked from Vidiello. Um, and I think you and I both know, especially if you go back to 2018, when, you know, again, the tough loss and penalty kick shootout, we saw Danny Vitiello's come up with some, some big time PK saves in the past two years. Yeah. And so that, I think that was something that stood out to, to coach Lilly and uh, his goalkeepers uh, coach. I know Will Marshall's the goalkeepers coach now. So, all mm -hmm. right, so let's move on. We got a lot of players to cover. Let's just kind of just kind of go through this again one more time real quick. So uh, Ezra Armstrong, uh, winger outside back. My quick two cents was that I thought he, when he had the opportunities, he showed some flashes. Your thoughts, Jordan? Yeah, yeah I agree. Uh, he's fast, that's for sure. And um, he's one of those players where it's like, is he, is he a wing back or is, is he a left winger? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess maybe he's someone where he really just wants to go and attack. So he's not someone you'd maybe want in that wing back position because he brings that little bit of risk. So you're afraid of him, uh, turning the ball over in the midfield, but yeah, I thought he, uh, he showed some flashes, had some good assists out there. Um, I think he had a one, two assist game at home. Um, yeah, it, he's a very solid player. Um, we'll young see too. next year. Yeah, he's young and we'll see if he's able to get more playing time. It's just, he, I mean, with someone like Velarde leaving though, uh, you know, that maybe that gives him a chance more next year. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, next up, uh, we'll uh, talk about, um, let's go with the center backs. Let's just kind of put them all in one pool. We got Mikel Williams, Jalen Robinson, Preston Kilwin, Shane Wheat. Uh, wait, um, Jelani Peters and Casey Bartlett Scott. Uh, you know, that's a group that all they got initiated to, to, you know, Lily Ball, if you will, this year. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one thing I guess I, I could mention now that I, I heard earlier in the season was that a trade almost went through on Mikhail Williams. Uh, it didn't fall through. Apparently, like last minute, it didn't work out. So I just assume he's not a player moving forward that they're, you know, super excited about. I mean, I don't think he was bad at all, but um, as well, uh, Casey Barlett Scott, I mean, he practically didn't play, you know, I don't think he's in there. Uh, um, he's going to be headed in, in their direction moving forward. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, I would say, I mean, the Williams piece was interesting because yeah. it felt like he started to play better after, you know, you mentioned that to me. <laughs> uh, it just kind yeah. of started to fit in and gel better. But, you know, we'll see. I, 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 but as far as Casey Bartlett Scott, just it was unfortunate in some respects. He had a work visa situation. He couldn't get here in time for training camp. He was part of the Erie Commodores team that the Hounds played in the 2019 Open Cup. He's from England. It'll be interesting. I, I, yeah, I don't see. I don't see him. I don't see them moving on with him, uh, unless Bob saw something really great that he he just you know he he can use him as a, as a you know depth type player going into next season. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what about uh, Peters and and Robinson and Wheat and and Kilwin? Yeah, uh, the four of them, I mean, I thought they were all uh, pretty solid, specifically uh, Wheat uh, for the most part. Um, I think Shane Wheat was probably their best defender of the season. Um, he, he played pretty good at center back, but I think when they did occasionally run that 4-1-4-1, I think that's when I liked him most when he was at right back. I really thought, I really think he is a hell of a right back. Really? And I just, I'd love for them to get, you know, I mean, maybe between one of Peters or Williams, but I think there's got to be another guy or two that's just better on that back line if they're able to. Um, Jelani Peters, very good in the air, very physical, but uh, I don't think clean enough um, on the back line with his feet. Just too many giveaways sometimes back there. Um, Williams, less giveaways, but, you know, we just talked about him. And, and Robinson, you know, uh, I feel like you just kind of barely notice him. Nothing too bad happens. Nothing too great. Um, we'll, we'll see if they they want to keep him around. Uh, I'm not sure. I think Bob Bob has had enough of a <laughs> 32 game, but spread out. He was mixing the lineup so much. I don't think yeah, the, the back lot. line had enough time to gel. But at the same time, by the at the end of the season, and Bob talked about this in the post game press conference is that they were at a po point where he felt really good about the way they were coming together. So when hearing that, I'm thinking, okay, he's probably going to bring the nucleus, what he feels is the nucleus of that group. But I think there might be some guys that he won't opt to, to resign from that group. As you mentioned, I think you made some, some valid, uh, you know, pros and cons uh, for some of those, for those players. I also wondered, you know, there have been years and Bob has even told me where, you know, hey, I, I had my I really wanted this guy and the Louisville City beat me to him or this. So I think he's also looking to see who's out there looking at the market. Uh, if the, the Hounds can get a, an experienced type of uh, center back to, to pair with Wheat, say, for example, or Kilwin. And, you know, he's got some guys that he really likes, but maybe get that one more guy that could maybe just take them up a notch in terms of defensively. Like obviously Tampa Bay is playing in the finals cup final tonight. Forrest Lasso is just the guy in the middle there. And he's a, he's yep, a yep. leader and he's all that, this and that. Maybe they're missing that, just that guy, that leadership type, no knock on any of the players in the back line this past year, but just maybe that guy that, you know, maybe there's a guy out there that they could sign and that the uh, Tufty Schallenberger the owner is probably like, you know, Bob, Bob has the green light and he wants to sign certain player. He does want to sign a, a high caliber player that he could find. And I think it'll be interesting to see. I think I go along with the, the idea that they're going to bring as much as they can back to the back line, but I think they're going to be looking out in the market for some, maybe so a couple guys. That, um, and it, I, I feel bad because the name escapes me, but, the, the the player uh, from who they signed in the off season was an, ended up um, they let go of his contract uh, was an MLS uh, defender and and he ended up re-signing with Orlando. Um, that's that's the and I think Bob had that's what he had envisioned last year going into mm -hmm. this season was signing a player of that caliber to be part of the back line. I think they're going to, I think they're going to go in that direction again, this off season. I think they're going to be looking for someone or maybe another player or two to kind of reinforce what they, but keep this, this group intact. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think they definitely should. They definitely should have their eyes open out there for a guy like that, a, a Forrest Lasso who could just be that leader who could just be, 
that guy who basically plays every minute of the season in the back line. They, they had that in, in Danny Griffin in the midfield. Um, and up top, you know, Dixon and Ciceroni both, uh, you know, were, were really good. I, I truly felt like this past season, if, if their season weren't to end of COVID, if, if they just had one more guy that was really, really good on that back line, um, and, you know, maybe you sprinkle some more talent up top, like just a little bit, I, I think they, they really had a shot to win it all. Um, but they, they did beat Tampa twice, and they're in the final tonight so i mean maybe they could have done it without another defender too but um yeah we'll see yeah i think just the the confidence was certainly there heading into the postseason this was a confident group Mm -hmm. i think they felt they could do it bob built this team you know coming off of last year's what happened and what he saw he didn't but he felt like this group uh, or the group from 2020 just wasn't dynamic enough getting forward. He kind of changed some things uh, tactically a little bit in terms of wanting to get players that could make those runs effectively in spaces. And obviously you talk about the next layer, the other players that we haven't talked about in terms of players, they have contract options for. And I think it's, in my opinion, I know Alex Dixon's 31 years old, but Canardo Forbes is 33. Um, Mm -hmm. Russell Cicerone, obviously, <clears throat> really at the peak of his powers, I would think. He's really coming into his own as a professional player. So I think that, you know, those guys, I think with if they do not re-sign Dequa, they're definitely going to be on the market for another forward or two. You know, you're not going to sign, re-sign Dequa potentially, as we're saying here. Maybe, they, maybe Bob really likes Dequa, and he will go with that and try to re-sign him. Tommy Williamson's not coming back. You're going to need a, you, they're absolutely going to need a center forward. Um, somebody that can, you know, hold the ball up and do all those things. Again, we talk about Tampa Bay. Steven Dos Santos is in the final. He scored the game winning goal um, to beat Tampa, uh, to beat Louisville city in the semifinal. Mm-hmm. So that's a presence that I thought Tommy Williamson in his rookie year and, you know, an MLS caliber player, it looks like, did it did a fine job of in this season kind of kind of keep doing that Cicerone sometimes moved up top into that spot sometimes too but I, I think they're gonna they're definitely gonna be on the market for a couple more guys especially the center forward types yeah I think what Bob likes about Dequa um and I don't know if he likes it enough to want to bring him back really bad but he does the little things well like winning balls in the air really pressing the center backs, like just the, that blue collar work ethic of a mm-hmm. forward. Cause there's a lot of forwards that they don't want to do that. Um, I mean, I think Ciceroni and Dixon and, and other guys, they do do that. But with Dickwell, you really notice it. It was just the finishing that was an issue. And Tommy Williamson, absolutely. I, I wish he could come back. Um, if he had size, he would be just like a Steven Dos Santos, um, you know, great finishing ability, great in the box instincts, Um, but yeah, with Williamson gone, someone else is going to have to learn how to score a free kick. (laughs) I mean, I I know Kenny takes them a lot. Um, a lot of times, to be honest, he hits it over the bar a good bit. Like if he, if he's going to goal, uh, with the shot, but yeah, someone's got to learn how to score (laughs) a free kick. (laughs) Yeah. They, they need to be, I mean, I thought they got a little bit better as the season progressed in terms of set pieces, but you're right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You want to have that dangerous, you know, we heard things going into the off season about Louis Perez. Louis Perez uh, yeah. is, is I, I mean, he could be on the fringe. Is he the, like the next Velarde? If Velarde is now come, not coming back, maybe you bring Perez back again for another season, kind of maybe, maybe he can take his game to the next level. Yeah, I, I hope so. He's young, um, just out of uh, college. I believe he went to UCF, uh, yeah. Central Florida. And mm-hmm. yeah, and uh, he's got talent, that's for sure. And he's great up the wing, the left or right side. Uh, he's dynamic. Um, I think I think he's the type of player that Bob probably nags on a lot because I don't think he's strong defensively. Um, so, you know, to to make Bob happy and to get that playing time, you have to do that. But, yeah, I really hope he just, you know, really has a good year, maybe becomes a consistent starter. So, yeah, Louis Perez and obviously we're both in agreement. <laughs> you know, Alex Dixon and Cicerone are, are absolute must to bring them back. Keep that duo yeah. growing. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, uh, for sure. Yeah. They're, they're the best one two punch. One of the best one two punches in the league. 
the two of them. And we didn't talk about Todd Wharton. Now, Todd is, uh, mm. again, especially, you know, what happens if they can't re-sign Danny Griffin? You know, you have, you have an experienced guy that you can just, you know, he's, you just re-sign him. Uh, you, you got his option there sitting there. So then Bob can maybe look at the college market and look at the young players that are out there that maybe where's the next Danny Griffin? Where's the next Robbie Mertz? Mm-hmm. You know, Bob's over constantly looking in the market uh, for those type of players. I, I also think it's a no brainer to resign Wharton as long as, uh, you know, it's, it's everything fits, you know, it's, it's a fit, right? Yeah. I would love to bring him back. Um, yeah, it just really depends on, you know, who they're bringing in if they lose Griffin. Um, if they lose Griffin, I definitely think Wharton or Forbes as of now could take on that role of us uh, sitting back in the six. Um, Wharton could, you could even try to be training him at center back or, or a wing back, like a right back. Um, he definitely has the IQ to do it. Um, but yeah, I, I love Todd. He's just, he's consistent, um, works hard. He's not flashy, not, you know, um, not too, too many fancy moves or anything, but he just keeps it simple. So you like a guy like that, where you just know what you're getting out of, out of him every night. For sure. All right. So the only players that we haven't talked about, uh, we mentioned Canardo Forbes a, a number of times. You know, he signed, uh, re-signed this off past off season. Danny Rivera is another player who had to, you know, ended his contract ended in tw- at the end of 2020. They did re-sign him. They do have his option as well. And I thought, really, if you were to give me the most improved player award for the ra- the Hounds player, um, you know, I just I just feel like Rivera each season has gotten better and better. Whether he comes back or not, I'm not sure. Again, you know, and, and one thing we didn't really talk about in terms of like the Velarde decision or or any player really for that matter is you just we just don't know the bot you know the bottom line in terms of maybe player preferences are to move closer to home. Maybe you know they're they're looking at maybe their college professional career winding down and maybe we'll start looking at getting into the real world. There's a lot of factors involved. I know that um, guys want to want to try to prolong their careers as much as possible. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to kind of add that point. But, you know, again, Rivera, I thought in terms of being a kind of a versatile guy, you could put him in different positions this year. He did that mm-hmm. a number of times and he, he was helpful getting forward sometimes I uh, had some nice assists and some nice playmaking type of things that he did, uh, but also defensively. And when he needed somebody to, he need they needed somebody to mark a really good player. They they called on Danny Rivera the last couple of years. So, I think he's a player really worth keeping uh, if they can keep him around. Yeah, to me, when he was in the starting lineup, I felt like he was the X factor because if he was feeling it that night, he could really make a difference, whether it was him having a man mark or if he was playing at his usual left wing back kind of position when they played the five, uh, five, two, three. Um, he, some, some nights I'd see him give a couple giveaways away and I'd be like, uh, you know, they're probably going to sub him off, which they usually would eventually in the second half. But then some nights, you know, he'd play all 90 and I'm like, he's one of the best players out there right now. So yeah, he, he's he's definitely been uh, improving past couple of years, and um, yeah, I think Bob likes him a lot. All right, so I think we've we've covered every player except Josh Gad, who obviously oh, had yeah. a tough injury setback. You know, he's a one-time United States national team player, and mm-hmm. you know, had the MLS experience, has played overseas. There was one more go here in Pittsburgh, and it just it didn't you know it didn't really amount to much. I know Mark Goodman talked a bit about his you know maybe earlier in the season when he was trying to fight for playing time that he you know he that Cicerone basically beat him out uh, for that spot. So I I have a hard time seeing the Hounds re-sign the guy, but the, there is a certain ceiling that he did have at one point. Um, but it's it's a shame to see him have to you know go through the injury he went through again and have a knee surgery again, Jordan. Yeah, I mean that's just tough at his age. It, it makes sense to start playing the younger player like Cicerone. I mean, look how look how great he was. Obviously, I don't think Josh Gad, whether he wasn't, um, if he if he was healthy, was going to put up those numbers. Um, I, I mean, not that I don't think he would be bad, but 
yeah, I feel bad for him. And, uh, you know, if I had to bet what the type of guy he is, he, he probably doesn't want to be done just yet. Um, I don't know where he'll end up. I don't know if he'll be back at the Hounds, but um, I'm sure he wants another go. Uh, you know, you just don't want to end that way. All right. So before we end our show, uh, Jordan, just kind of your final thoughts on the 2021 edition of the Riverhounds. My thought is that when we look back five, ten years from now, this is going to be the team that is going to be – it's an incom- – I mean, we thought last year kind of felt like an incomplete season just because of the, mm-hmm. the length of time. But this season feels – it just feels like something – it's a real incomplete if you were to do a report card. But my other th- – thought on all of this is it it's possible that this could be the lightning rod for next year that you know we just saw yeah i mean it's a completely different level but quaker valley and uh, the wpil and the piaa i mean unfortunate covid situation yeah. ended their season last year and boy did they i mean did they come out all gangbusters this year and really just dominate the 2A boys level. A completely different conversation here. We're talking about professional. We're talking about the hounds have to over, you know, they'll have to, they'll have to get past, figure out a way to get past Tampa and Louisville. And this is such a tough, tough uh, Eastern conference every year. But something tells me that this is going to be a very highly motivated group next year, especially if you bring back a lot of these players. Yeah, if you bring the core of these players back, and and we know how great Bob is and um, how serious of a coach he is, uh, he's going to get this team prepared for next season. Um, It it sucks the way it ended, and they're all probably still thinking about it. You know, it's just it's just unfortunate, and we know Tuffy's upset. We know everyone in that organization is just like, uh, why is it going to end this way? But um, yeah, I, I think that will motivate them. How they just they didn't even get a shot. It's not like they went out and lost five nothing in the first round. They just they didn't even get a shot. Um, that's just got to be so frustrating. And yeah, Quaker Valley was able to do this. You know, they weren't able to play with COVID issues, and they come back and just beat everyone. Um, and they beat the heck out of them usually. And uh, Conestoga out in Philly, they did the same thing um, at the four A level. They they weren't able to play at all last year um, in the playoffs, and then they were twenty six and zero this year, I think. Um, and they didn't they didn't dominate Seneca Valley in the final, but um, I think they had a little bit of the edge of the play. And yeah, so they were clearly motivated to do that. So, yeah, there's it, it, something to be said for wanting to get to that finish line. And it's a long season, yeah. but guys that I mean, they're, they're, they're going to they're gonna want to make that commitment to come back and come back. Let's just let's be honest, like come back and play for Bob Lilly is never mm-hmm. an easy thing. You know, like they know <laughs> it's going to be a tough it's going to be a grind. One more season for Conardo Forbes, maybe a couple more seasons. I mean, we don't know how much more he's got left in the tank. I know he's his soccer IQ. He's still able, you know, in terms of fitness level, I think he's still there. You know, maybe yeah. he can't do some of the things he used to do, but he's such an intelligent player that I don't think that will affect him. I think he can be still be this team's leader, uh, at least mm-hmm. in terms of uh, creating and playmaking and, and dictating tempo. Yeah, it's like Chavi and Iniesta at like age 39. Like they weren't what they used to be, not as quick, but their IQ is just unmatched. And and that that's kind of how Kenny is at that level, you know, at the USL level. Um, he's just he's just notoriously known as one of the best center mids in in the league and getting uh, second USL team honors again this year. Um, unfortunately, I, I feel like Cicerone and, and Dixon were were snubbed off the list, but there, there's so many good players. It's it's tough with, you know, uh, over 20 teams to get like three guys on the squad. It, it's tough. Absolutely. I heard uh, Orange City yeah. weren't happy, uh, kind of played with a chip on their shoulders through the playoffs this year. And now they're playing Tampa tonight in the final. I think they only had one player represented in all the U.S. all USL teams. So, okay. all right. So it'll be it should be a very interesting offseason. I definitely will be getting back probably with Mark Goodman at some point. Uh, get his takeaways on a lot of things uh, as they as the hounds head into the offseason of course his perspective i'm sure he's got some interesting perspectives on all of this as well um, he always does yeah. <laughs> he always does and we appreciate really love having him uh, as a contributor as well pittsburgh soccer now um jordan any 
before we go, uh, any sort of highlight? I know, again, the season didn't end for the Hounds in a very good way. And I, I'd like to point out one thing, too, as well. Bob Lilly had a post, uh, the last, like a get together with the media about a week and a half after the season ended. And I think Mark actually spoke eloquently about to Bob and said, you know, obviously, they're members of the media aren't as uh, you know, part of the team, but you know, I think we all felt the sort of a sense of disappointment and frustration mm -hmm. uh, with the fact that the, the season ended the way it did. Yeah, I mean, you see these guys travel all across the country to to go out and play these games, and and you know, obviously, just saying, you know, these guys are grinding, and they're just they're just trying to get to the next level, or or they're trying to enjoy the the years of professional soccer they have left. Um, and yeah, the River Hounds, I, I feel like they've really built a very good culture, and and probably a huge part of that. Um, and all the all the employees there, they treat us when, in Highmark Stadium, just a beautiful facility to watch games at. Um, so yeah, we all really felt, um, you know, we're not a part of the team, but it really felt like we wanted to be on that journey with them throughout the playoff run, and just didn't get it. Absolutely, and one uh, another quick kind of way to recap the uh, the year. I know at the beginning of the year we do media predictions uh, for the seasons. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of us came pretty close. I think we were pretty close in terms of where the hounds would end yeah. up, at least looking at the table in the season. I, I was really close. I think I was like 18. I had 18, 18, 7, and 7. I think you were pretty close too. 18, 7, and 7. I think they ended up 17, 8, and 7. So for what it's worth. Uh, but we were all, yeah. all of us were in that kind of 55 to 62 mark. So we all thought this kind of that same thing. And they really ended up, I think it was 58 points they ended up with in 2021. So mm -hmm. um, whatever it's worth, our little pats on the back to ourselves. Um, Jordan, is, <laughs> is this the season that you, I mean, again, not the, the way things ended, but is it what you expected? Yeah, pretty much. Um, I think in my predictions, I had like, I think I got three out of the four teams correct. And um, I said Hartford would barely miss out and, I, and they did. Mm -hmm. So I think I was right on that. But yeah, I had Tampa Bay at first. So I, I kind of figured we were going to be second. Um, and, you know, that's how it ended up. Um, yeah, I, I think I want to say they should have won like three more games because it's just they dropped some bad losses to uh, Loudoun United, Austin Bold. Um, there's an, another one in there I wasn't happy with. And obviously, obviously Bob wasn't happy with them either. You know, and, and then that, that, that's the thing, too, is you could be driving by Highmark. The game is was out was over an hour ago, but they yeah. won three nothing or they lost one nothing. Like you just don't know. Bob's yelling at them um, for an hour after the game. But, yeah, I, I, I felt pretty much that's. That's about wh where they should have finished and how many wins they should have had. Um, but yeah, probably a couple more. I always say that after every like Penguins and Steelers season, though. <laughs> but yeah, that's just being well, a homer. <laughs> they definitely, mm -hmm. uh, I think they're going to want to, you know, the 20 win mark or something like that, I think is really maybe what they'll be shooting for uh, to kind of get climb, mm -hmm. finish higher up in the table, maybe secure those home playoff matches, which, which, we've missed for a few years now. So I think they're going to be yeah. itching to get back to that point. So I think all, I think they're pretty well set, uh, set up for success. Um, if all falls their way in terms of, you know, being able to bring this roster back and, um, and be able to have a pretty good 2022 season. So, all right, Jordan, um, thank you so much for your insights. A lot of, you know, I see you, you can tell after the course of a 32 game season, you have something to say about each of the 32 players and, and I really appreciate yeah. your insights. And uh, it's just, sure. no, it's been great. Pittsburgh soccer. Now uh, we've been able to stick with our coverage and at least provides, you know, at all the home games, have somebody there. And even, you know, thanks to you, a couple of road games as well. Um, so thank you again. Appreciate everything you've done for Pittsburgh soccer now in the past you know, year plus, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to keep this thing going. Yeah, thanks, John. You too, leading the way. <laughs> All right. So, uh, if you're, uh, you know, before we like, uh, before we say goodbye, you know, Pittsburgh Soccer Now, we are 
Uh, definitely looking forward to additional pit coverage. We are going to have a couple very special guests on this forum in the coming days. So look out for that as we preview what's going to be a dynamite uh, Elite Eight matchup between Pitt and Notre Dame. So that should be fantastic. WVU is also in play, and they have to go to Georgetown. So <laughs> we might end up with a Pitt WVU uh, potential, uh, t- both of them in the Final Four. Uh, so it's it's the season hasn't ended. So look forward to more content uh, here on uh, Pittsburgh's. Uh, Soccer Now and Pittsburgh Sports Live uh, regarding the soccer scene here in Pittsburgh. Uh, Again, thanks for joining us, Jordan. Thanks uh, for being part of our Riverhounds coverage this year. Thank you, everyone. Take care. All right. Have a good one.